Welcome to the third paper in this session, another short paper, this one by Bernard Gleiss and Martin Suda. And I guess this is a special case of the full paper we saw in the PAR workshop yesterday. And so let's see what this is all about. Uh, by, and Bernard is doing the recorded talk. Hi, everybody. I will now present the work on layered class selection for theorism, which is joint work with Martin Suda. In a nutshell, this work is about high-level proof search heuristics for saturation-based theorem proof. Let's start with some background. Saturation-based theorem proving is a state-of-the-art reasoning approach for checking validity in first-order logic containing arbitrary quantification. It's complete for first-order logic even on the presence of arbitrary quantifier alternations, and there exist efficient implementations. In particular, the theorem prover Vampire, which Martin and I contribute to, and some other provers, like E or Spaß. Let's now look into how saturation works. Assume you want to prove a conjecture from some axioms A1 to AK. Throughout this talk, I will visualize these axioms using light green boxes, and I will visualize the negated conjecture as a dark green box. We now iteratively combine the clauses to new clauses, until at some point we hopefully derive the empty clause. Clauses are combined together using a given inference system, which I will not get into. But it has the important property that as soon as we derive the empty clause, we know that the conjecture follows from the input axioms. Let's now dive a little bit deeper into how saturation proceeds. We extend the current proof attempt with new clauses, until at some point we derive the empty clause and we know we are finished. Moreover, at any point during proof search, we keep a set of clauses, which I visualize in red here, which I call the one-step look-ahead. Intuitively, each clause in the one-step look-ahead is a clause which can be derived from clauses of the current proof attempt in a single step. The algorithm proceeds now as follows. In each round, it uses the so-called class selection heuristics to select a single clause from the look-ahead. Then, adds that clause to the proof, and updates the lookahead. It then proceeds in the next round by selecting another clause using the clause selection heuristics, adds that clause to the proof, and updates the lookahead. It continues doing that until at some point the empty clause is selected and added to the proof. At this point we know that the conjecture follows from the initial axioms. What you can see from this example is that there often exist clauses which are added to the proof attempt but will not be part of the final proof. In particular, it's very important that the clause selection heuristics works well and selects a lot of clauses which have a high probability to be part of the final proof. Let's now move to reasoning with theories. We are often interested in applications where we don't only need first order logic but also some background theories. So this could be, for instance, some form of arithmetic, difference logic, arrays, data types, or finite sets. But it could also be some advanced theory covering some form of pointer reasoning, matrix operations, cryptography, or even quantum computing. The standard approach to enable saturation-based theorem proving to reason in such theories is to provide an explicit list of axioms directly into the search space. In particular, we then not only start from the axioms and the negated conjecture, but also from the tier axioms which throughout the talk I will visualize using blue boxes. While providing explicit axioms is an intuitive and easy solution, which works incredibly well in many instances, there is a big problem that for many examples we see a big slowdown due to the blow up of the search space induced by the theory axioms. The problem here is that the theory axioms can repeatedly be combined with themselves or with other axioms and then generate cyclic patterns in the derivations. Most of the consequences generated this way would be immediately classified as useless by humans. To make the problem worse, many consequences are also early selected by existing clause selection heuristics. And as a result, more than 99% of the generated clauses are highly unlikely to contribute to the proof. The goal of our work is to improve on this situation. Well, this in general is a very hard task. What we want to do here is to enable efficient reasoning in application domains where the required proofs only contain lightweight tier reasoning. This is motivated by recent work on software verification of imperative programs including loops and arrays. 
And arguably, this should also cover many other industrial verification applications. So the big question is how to instrument the prover to search for proofs containing lightweight theories in it. The solution we present in our work consists of three parts. First, we fix the expected amount of theory reasoning and proofs of a given domain. Secondly, we define a feature, the so-called theory distance, which measures the difference between the amount of theory reasoning in the derivation of each clause and the expected amount of theory reasoning. And third, we use this theory distance feature to instrument clause selection such that for a given percentage of selected clauses, the theory distance is small and has a low value. Let's now look at each of these parts separately. We first fix the expected amount of theory reasoning by fixing a value d such that out of d all axioms we expect our proofs to have one theory axiom. For instance, on our domain of software verification, we often choose a d which is 8. As second part, we introduce the theory distance for each clause c. Intuitively, it denotes how far from the expected amount of theory reasoning is the amount of theory reasoning in the derivation of C. So let's look at an example. Consider the following derivation of the clause C. We expect for each theory axiom eight oval axioms. But in this derivation, we have one theory axiom, but only five oval axioms, which means that we would need three additional oval axioms to get to the expected amount of theory reasoning. Therefore, the theory distance with respect to d value eight of this clause is three. I also want to mention that it's very easy to compute this theory distance with a simple formula denoted below. Let's now look at how we can use this theory distance feature to derive a better clause selection reasonings. We consider different groups of clauses. On the one hand, we consider all the clauses where the theory distance is zero. So this is the group on the left side. On the other hand, we consider the group on the right side, which contains all the clauses where the theory distance is small or equal to infinity, which basically means all clauses. We then alternate between picking clauses from the left group and from the right group, using some ratio, in this case 4 to 1. After we have picked the group we want to select from, we use the existing clause selection heuristic to select from the clauses of this group. We could also consider a more advanced setup where you don't have two groups, but three groups. In this case, we would have the left group, which contains all the preferred clauses, the right group, which contains all clauses, and a middle group, which contains all clauses, which have a somewhat good value for the tier distance. We would then alternate picking clauses from these groups using, again, some ratio, for instance, in this case, four to two to one. More generally, our framework provides the following parameters. We can choose the number of groups, the expected amount of theory reasoning, the cutoffs used to group clauses together, and the ratio which we use to alternate between picking from different groups. We implemented our approach in the state-of-the-art superposition-based theorem prover vampire and evaluated our implementation on a subset of SMTlib consisting of over 20,000 problems. As first experiment, we ran Vampire in the default mode with a 10 second timeout. We compared the default clause selection heuristics with instantiations of our framework having two, three, or four groups. For each of these instantiations, we optimized the d value, the cutoffs, and the ratio. When we look at the results, we see that even a two group setup improves over the default strategy by solving 25% more problems. We can also see that if we increased the number of groups, we further improve the overall number of solved benchmarks. A second experiment, we ran Vampire in portfolio mode with a 500 second timeout. We compared the default clause selection heuristics to the best instantiation for a framework from the last experiment. What we can see here is that we improve the existing portfolio mode by solving 150 additional problems. In particular, we also solve 344 problems which the portfolio mode couldn't solve before. One can imagine that incorporating our heuristics already during training the portfolio mode would further improve the results. Summing up, we looked at saturation-based theory improving with theories and in particular at applications where only lightweight theory reasoning is required. We introduced a new clause selection heuristic which is based on a clause feature which measures the amount of theory reasoning 
and on grouped arrangements. Our experiments suggest that this new technique drastically improves the performance of our saturation-based Turing pool vampire. Thank you. Right, we have time for questions, and I see Bernard's on. Are you unmuted as well? If anybody wants to raise a hand or put it in the Q&A, I'll bring you in. So I'll be waiting for that. I want to ask a quick question. Um, in the early slide, you said that 99% of inferred clauses are highly unlikely to be useful. Was that a figure of speech, or do you actually have data on that? Uh, yes, we we actually have data. So for for some uh, for some concrete domain, so for our software verification domain, um, we really looked at, at at the results there, and I think we got ninety nine point six or or even more. Wow, which that's, insane. that's absolutely insane. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's it's I think it's really um, only a few cycles which which generate this problem. So we you, you really see then a list of clauses, and all of them look very the same, really the same, and just very some constants or so. So. That's where the idea then came from. All right. There's anybody else? Uh, Giles. Hello. Yep, you're on. Um, so this work, and I think other kind of work on on this is, is is kind of focused on. So we've got these theory axioms. We throw them into proof search, and then we just let them get on with it. But they get a bit too. Um, too excited, so let's try and get them less excited. But we don't really look at whether on which what's happening, what kind of um, uh, um, derivations we're seeing. Uh, do you think it would be um, so, so? So, for example, um, uh, maybe we maybe we'd like to encourage inferences which are to do with uh, multiplication, but not addition. In this case, do you think you could take a more fine grained um, look at the the kind of um, theory that's happening, rather than just yes and no. So, I, I guess what you're suggesting is that we could introduce, let's say, different different penalties for different uh, theory axioms, um, and we we definitely can do that if if we want to. It of course really depends on on what you want to prove. Um, I think you have to be a bit. Uh, uh, a bit careful because um, if you start to use different weights, then the the, the proof I think can get very creative with um, combining clauses together in a way such that the the heuristics then is still small because um, um, it like if you have a cyclic a clause which can generate a cycle which um, doesn't introduce a penalty then basically if the prover does um, applications of this clause, it actually makes the theory distance smaller. And so this could be a problem in some cases. But I think in general, um, it's definitely possible to make a more fine-grained uh, theory distance if you have a certain fixed application scenario in mind. Yeah, I think a, a more uh, concrete, a better example of the point I was making was um, like we, we, we like addition, but these um, axioms around um, okay, orderings uh, are usually uh, not not as useful. Uh, so that was a better example. Okay. Yeah. So so that would would definitely work. Um, in the in the extended uh, version of uh, our work, which Martin presented yesterday at the Power Workshop, um, we also uh, allow these nestings of of um, such uh, layer selections. And what you could do, for instance, is you could still use the um, uh, feature presented here, but then use an additional feature which only measures the uh, amount of um of all these ordering axioms and even penalize this further so i think this should work thank you thank you giles has anybody else got any questions for bernhard i've got one more we just quickly got a minute i noticed in your data the very good data had cutoffs for the fractional theory reasoning at 16, 41, 59, and then the top case of infinity. How did you choose those cutoffs? Are they magic numbers or did you go drink a lot of beer? <laughs> yeah, so we, um, we, we started from, from some educated guessing and then used randomized hill climbing to deduce them um, and could therefore optimize a bit further. But um, I think it's, it already works very well with, with quite simple um, 
uh, uh, values with very intuitive ones. And then you can, of course, optimize a bit further on them. But I wouldn't emphasize this, this, this really fine tuning uh, too much. So I think even even choosing, let's say, one one to eight for for like quite an arbitrary domain, if it's if it's application focused for some um, verification task, is usually already works much better than the default class selection, in my uh, experience. Yeah, I think ex uh, human experience will probably give you about the right numbers, and fine tuning is just something that an undergrad can do. <laughs> All right, thank you, Bernard. Let's